very happy to be here to talk to you about science and technology disruptors in biomedical research. Hoping to give you a couple of examples where not only how the field is moving in the forward direction, but also how we ourselves are contributing to this effort in bringing changes and innovations in biomedical research with our own efforts and uh, our, our contributions at IIT Kanpur, especially in the Ganwal School of Medical Sciences and Technology. Right. So, uh, as you would realize, uh, the medical spending all over the world has been quite enormous and basically this is the spending which is driving the research and technology and research and innovation in healthcare. If you take the examples of drug discovery effort, if you take the example of examples of new animal and toxicity models all the way from bench to bedside translation, Everything is being dictated by the amount of money they spend, we spend around the world in, in getting the right kind of healthcare benefits. And our own country has been, you know, uh, driving this agenda forward of, of coming up with the right kind of healthcare. If you look at the policy interventions that have been brought in the government, where we are really having a very large internal demand, and you would agree with me that with a 1.4 billion population, there is a value addition in such type of endeavors and we realize that uh, uh, the, the economics where we are reaching close to 40,000 crore in spending with, with our you know, lifestyle diseases, with the new diseases that are coming up every now and then, including the kind of health services and medicines are, that are required in various hospitals, in various government schemes, all that put together is, is, is driving us forward in bringing us the right kind of changes required for our biomedical sciences, including government investment. So there are enhanced invest investments to a number of policies that have been brought up and the first and foremost being Ayushman Bharat in the last so many years and now the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission where most of what we are doing at the moment is being translated to digital platform and these policies and schemes are the ones which are driving the research forward, including the kind of investment that science and technology agencies, in, uh, if you look at Department of Science and Technology, Biotechnology, ESIR, CSIR, and you look at ICMR, so all of these institutions, their research investments are driven towards bringing these policy changes to fruition and bring us to a level of, of uh, uh, sort of sophistication that would allow us not only to be the pharmacy of the world but also come up with the fact that we can now produce <coughs> indigenous drug discovery you know, uh, efforts and bring out newer drugs that are solely ident identified, manufactured in India and brought to the global stage. So what are the lift and lag situations if you look at biomedical research? With lift situations, I mean that where we stand from our strength and the lift situations are shown here. Of course, all these ideas are sort of, you know, condensed in few slides for our uh, consumption, but there is much more to look at. But what we really know is that we are the largest exporter of generic drugs. So if you look at the drugs which are being identified, which are being patented abroad, at time they are outsourced to India. Our CROs would synthesize and then bring, sell it back to the, the, the main agencies which are holding patent on these drugs. We, we are number three in terms of global market volumes when you look at uh, disease, uh, when you look at drugs, when you look at a variety of healthcare you know, issues that bring us revenue. So we are number three in terms of global market and number of plants that would make these drugs, these APIs, etc. We are standing at we have the highest number of MBA approved plants. So, with such kind of you know uh, 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 infrastructure being available, there is market, there is the, the possibility of being the, 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 having the largest number of plants where we can synthesize such type of drugs, and we are being the largest exporter. We still, I'm sorry to tell you that we still are unable to fulfill what could be the sort of benchmark in terms of drug discovery, in terms of bringing the right kind of drugs to the market and that is solely 
driven by the fact that we are very very you know sort of drawn back we are not at the at the front where we could create or we could synthesize active pharmaceutical intermediates that could be taken to the next level of drug discovery and pharmaceutical synthesis and this this chart basically tells you our reliance on on china on other countries where we import quite a bit of active pharmaceutical intermediates then think of converting these active pharmaceutical intermediates to drug so what is lacking if we have everything if we have right kind of research infrastructure if we have right kind of you know even manufacturing base what is lacking in india which which is un which is not possible or, or which is preventing us from becoming the leaders at the world stage now i'll take you to to another aspect of drug discovery that what we have been doing so far is very conventional drug, drug discovery we are not looking at the newer interventions that have come to the world stage we are unable to target the demand drivers that are present in pharmaceutical industries at, at the moment not only conventional conventionally relying on our synthetic abilities but how to identify uh, an adaptive structure from scratch that is one of our problem so if you, if you look at the the iterative process of drug discovery and if you go through the, the systems approach how one can discover a drug how one can bring it to to lab clinics all the way to to uh, 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 to market to commercialization there is whole bunch of you know problems that that we face and at the moment if you leave aside academics because we are here to do uh, minimal amount of r&d interventions in terms of r&d or therapeutics r&d but if you look at molecular target if you want to look at commercial r&d opportunities we are simply not at the right moment to 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 use this opportunity and create something new create a drug which is totally made in india and then sold to world uh, to to world market so if if you look at such kind of situation what comes to our mind is that what are the nuts and bolts that we require when we look at drug discovery process going deep into the problem and coming up with solutions that could be beneficial that could lead us to to a right kind of you know approaches right kind of solutions where we can think of coming up with the uh, uh, drug discovery process and i apologize for some some jumbles with which happened because of computer change so if you look at omics approach for drug discovery this is you know the most fundamental concept at the moment and most of us even if we are not working in the area of drug, drug discovery would realize that we can look at four different macro molecules or molecules that could be used for exploitation for omics approach in drug discovery where we can think of dna not only from the genomic standpoint but we can also look at epigenomics we can look at rna and rna as soon as you talk about rna you are talking about transcriptomics proteins proteomics metabolites metabolomics so the amount of data that has been generated at the moment when you look at all these studies that are being done at various level it is incredible amount of data that which is available to us but again the problem is the despite the bulk of data being generated our resources are limited our our our, our tools to use this data in order to translate this data to something very useful is limited and this transparency this slide shows you exactly what i mean by this statement if you look at total number of predicted predicted genes in homo sapiens there are about 30000 genes right 30000 ah 30000 genes number of proteins of the proteome about 22000 but there are only 3000 proteins that are runnable what it means is that in our body or in such type of cell system you have about 3000 proteins that could be part of a disease state that could be target to elicit a response a biological response that could be manifested as a, a biological response which is relatable to the drug discovery process but out of this 3000 proteins which are runnable target only 10% are exploited so far so only 300 proteins basically so to say are being used at the moment for for runnable target so it means that 90% of the total proteins which are runnable are simply out of our reach and why is it so because 
the amount of again the amount of data that is generated and the tools that are available in our hands are simply incompatible either they are incompatible or we are unable to use them properly to, to elicit a response for the rest of the 90 percent of the protein so if you look at the macromolecular targets if you want to look at a good good target for the no discovery i think a lot has to be done a lot of you know Charity has to happen both at academics level as well as at Indian pharmaceutical industry level to allow them to come to a stage where they are able to look at uh, such type of uh, uh, processes, such type of you know targets, and come with, uh, come up with a suitable uh, intervention. Sorry. Yes. What are the detective percentage of these target molecules like protein polysaccharide and so, no, here we are only talking about proteins. So, when you know the first point you have written at the here, point. yeah, yeah. So, among these, what is the related percentage of the target? I would say I would not know the exact percentage, or I would not like to give it to you, but bulk of the drug targets are proteins, as you know, followed by nucleic acids, and then you talk about lipid, lipid fibers, and so on and so forth. So, so, proteins would include all your receptors, enzymes and other small, smaller polypeptides that, are, that can be targeted, followed by, you know, uh, so one would look at uh, proteins, then nucleic acids, then a bit of polypept, uh, polysaccharides and lipids. So polysaccharide targeting, as far as I, as I recall and as I know, it is really not that, that uh, uh, easily achievable because of the complexity of the structure that exists for polysaccharides. So if you look at the drug discovery process in terms of uh, what is being done at the moment, it is, it is quite a laborious intensive exercise. So you look at a target, you sometimes you look molecular modeling approaches trying to figure out the active sites, look at you know docking studies etc. And you, you come up with experiments that are iterative in process, very time consuming, very, very intensive, laborious, laborious, expensive and that is the reason why most of our companies, if you only talk about the opinion context, they are not really interested in, come up, in coming up with strategies for discovery. So there is a disconnection between innovation acceleration, although the knowledge base is there, although there is an intention to come up with something important because the, the real translation or the commercial utilization of such type of invention is such then one could make a lot of money, but at the moment that is not possible because the, the, the pipeline, the way we work is not really suited for high throughput discovery process. So what is being doubted at the moment is that is it possible for us to bring in digital innovation? So you would now, if you look at literature, you will talk, people talk about digital chemistry digital synthesis you know it, nobody uses nowadays the, the uh, uh, former phrase of computer aided drug discovery that nobody uses that they instead they talk about digital chemistry and that is where we would like to hit at if we want to be successful if we want to lead from in this direction because lot of open informatic sources are, are available lot of biomedical data is available that can be capitalized with the help of newer interventions such as algorithms, machine learning algorithms or artificial intelligence. And this is where a confluence of deep, drug, deep tech and drug discovery is coming to the fore at the moment. So what, what we have realized, and if you look at literature, about 70 odd companies or 100 odd, odd companies around the world are trying to look at this problem which is about 5 to 7 years old. So the field is still very nascent, field is really, you know, sort of poised where we can enter and come up with strategies that would help us in bringing out the right kind of interventions. And which is aided by the fact that there is a lot of biomedical data that is available. You, 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 you will be very surprised to know that almost 800,000 worth of terabyte, uh, terabyte worth of data gets generated every day, which can be sort of brought back to the discovery process to bring out the changes that we are talking about. So where are these data coming from? They are, are coming from genomic, proteomic, metabolomic, lipidomic and all these kind of omics data. How to use them is the challenge. How to bring it and integrate it is the challenge in addition to data that is being generated by health apps, wearables and other kind of sensors that we hear every day 
and or, or when we go to a uh, to a health practitioner, the kind of data that get generated as part of electronic medical record, that has to be integrated, and that is not happening at the moment. So once this this challenge is taken care of, then you can bring in AI driven solutions, etc. We talk about that in a minute to bring out the right kind of revolution we are, we are looking at. So what we are ideally looking at is reimagining the future where we digress from what is the current state of the art of discovery process and go to data by using all the steps which are shown here. I won't go into the detail because of the paucity of time, but each of these steps are intertwined with one another. Each step is intertwined and at this moment the right kind of strategic investment in one of these, these steps would bring in enormous benefit for all of us and this is where I think ideally we are, we have to target to bring in the SNP disruption in terms of you know uh, leaping ahead in biomedical science and of course I had already mentioned about artificial intelligence it is taking root in drug discovery, it is taking root in biomedical data science and that is not only allowing the predictability of a disease but also allowing us to look at biomedical data from a very different standpoint. What I show you here is a paper from chemical science where they are talking about how DNA double helix generation of messenger RNA looking at all the proteins, their, their interaction with smaller molecules and within a cell, within an organelle can eventually offer you a type of phenotypic study or phenotypic studies that would permit the, the, the interventions which are required for drug discovery. So we are looking at network embedded systems within eukaryotic cells and, and, and subsystems of the organelles and when you have all this data available with you, one could train an algorithm on millions of genotypes, millions of, millions of phenotypical you know, consequences when you can predict in a machine and that eventually is going to be uh, useful for machine learning predicted uh, uh, drug discovery process. And just to show you an example, this is just a G protein coupled receptor and its interaction within a, a, a cell type. So you can just imagine the network and how complex these networks are. It is not possible to bring in one small molecule at a time and hope for a radical a radical discovery without really aiding your discovery process with computational approaches. And one such example of computational approach, of course not related to drug discovery is where these researchers actually extracted data from, from a database of adult coronary heart disease. So when we go to a doctor, we talk about our cholesterol, blood pressure and a variety of tests that are done, ECG etc. How to bring that data all in one place? So you bring bring in the raw data in one place from ACHD patients. Natural uh, natural language processing analysis was done on such clinical data, and eventually what they what they found out, say from a database of 1,000 patients, <coughs> they were accurately able to predict how many of these patients are really prone to heart attack in next two to three to five to six months. So. That kind of advanced predictability is coming from machine learning methods when you use the right kind of raw anonymized data and that, that definitely would, would fall within the, the, the context of science and tech SNT disruptors for, for, for biomedical science. <coughs> the next one I would like to point out to all of you is uh, the change in or the, the kind of you know a revolution that is happening in prosthetics and, and devices. If you were to know that the market segmentation, you would be really you know, amazed to see that not only we are driven by technology here where you know mechanical or body part prosthetics are in demand. Of course, you know, variety of other power sources can be envisaged. The products are going to be used in a variety of you know uh, uh, places like orthopedics, dental implant, cosmetics, aesthetics, and the end users are scattered all over with the market value what you see here an Indian market which is approaching close to 400 million US dollars by next year. So this is the market segmentation we are really pushing ahead in this direction because if you look at what is existing in this area is the indigenous effort that started long back alright in 1975 by 
by Mr. Dia Mehta, who, who invented what is known as the Jaipur food, right? And if you look at this particular book, which is written by C.K. Prahlad, of course, of course, from a very small number, Jaipur food became almost like a it is a synonymous with something which was frugal which was so useful for the society. Not only society, I mean people are using such type of artificial links and Ellen Kurt just around the corner in, in, in defense sector as well. So such such food are available to Jaipur food. In addition, what we also know is that at the moment there are about 150,000 knee replacements happening in India every year and about 80,000 hip procedures happening in India at the moment. Of course these numbers I know you take it with a pinch of salt, they are taken up from the internet. But what is important to realize is their cost. Enormously expensive and this is where we have to bring in the technology disruption, not only to get the, the uh, get ourselves away from import because about 90% of these limbs are imported from outside. We could possibly do additive manufacturing and that is state of the art. State of the art in the world at the moment is even some of the hospitals, if you know, they have the 3D printing facility within hospitals and they are producing limbs, they are producing little structures which are going to be put in a patient with the help of additive manufacturing process, be it 3D printing, prototyping, direct digital manufacturing and a variety of other machines that are available for, for such type of in interventions where people are making titanium based jobs. So you need titanium, I just highlighted because that is one of the most noble type of metal which is not going to elicit an immune response. It also allows, if you have the right texture, it allows the cells to adhere and you know grow around it. So titanium jaws, rib cages, knee and hip replacement, all are being manufactured with the help of additive manufacturing. And this is where I think our institute within the ambit of uh, Garhwal School would be working with, with some of us who are here to, to come up with you know uh, strategies where we can contribute to this particular area. And here is an example. I will show you an example. It is from literature again, where a person, where a patient had her rib cage or sternum replaced because she was suffering from chondrosarcoma. This is a cancer of bone very difficult situation so you really have to remove all the bones that are suffering from such type of disorder, such type of cancer. So surgically you would remove such type of sternum and ribcage and her sternum, sternum and ribcage were surgically implanted with the help of a, a titanium replacement which is shown here which is which was made of titanium as well as poly, uh, porous polyethylene. So, with, with such kind of strategies, it is possible for us to come up with strategies within, uh, uh, you know, within our knowledge base to create 3D printed medical implant and that would be one important part of uh, 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 what we would like to do at Bengal School of Medical Sciences and Technology. And I am going to tell you a bit about, I, I promise Professor Amrenzi, I will tell a few, with a few slides what is going on because some of you may not know, you may not be up to speed what is happening at Bengal School. So we are working on one of such devices. So I pointed out that we have sufficient knowledge base in our institute to create a big difference. And one such example is the Andhra, which is led by Professor Murlinger and colleagues. Uh, uh, Professor Balani here is also part of the team, which is trying to come up with IATK LVAD, which is left ventricle assist device. And we have taken this medical innovation challenge and full scheme we are going ahead. So a team which is comprised of mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, biological sciences, bioengineering, material scientists, they are all trying to create advanced artificial heart because at the moment again cost is the driving factor. Only 29,000 patients worldwide can afford artificial heart. It costs over a crore in India and up several millions of US dollars abroad. So just imagine if we were to come up with, with a breakthrough with an indigenous heart that is going to be really uh, uh, you know, exciting and of course we are being able aided by Narayan Kridhyala and Dr. Devi Shetty who are part of our clinical advisory group and uh, sort of helping us forward. So what has been done so far where we stand at the moment in Kridhyantra is that we have now uh, all the way starting from you know, generating homemade indigenous impeller which is made of titanium alloy in our institute 
we have gone to the second level where this impeller was was you know uh, uh, given one degree of freedom the kind right kind of motor electronics that can that can pump blood at the moment we are using gold blood to see what kind of effect or what kind of you know throw of blood that can be generated with IDK alloy and we have now graduated to three degrees of freedom in the impeller that has been machined within IT Kanpur and it is going very well. I mean now we have textured surfaces to allow the, the blood flow to happen to allow the, the complexity that, that happens with it. So because I, as I'm given to understand that this in this this uh, artificial device is throwing up blood, you have to be aware that you know these uh, red blood cells and other cells do not get disturbed, they, they are not ruptured and so on and so forth. So that that textured surfaces are being brought in and we are hoping to start the animal trials very soon at the moment. So, so this, this, this is very uh, uh, well taken up by a variety of doctors, a variety of hospitals. Apollo Ford is Medanda, Naran Vidyalaya is supported by the Sudamurti Infosys Foundation. And we are hoping that in another two years we would come out with the, the first device that can certainly be, be touted as, as purely ITK. And of course we have had a number of distinguished visitors who have thrown their weight around Given the full support, Dr. Trehan, Dr. Devi Shetty, many, many cardiovascular surgeons and doctors all around India are supporting IITK Alvar. So, of course, it has gathered a lot of attention. Some of you would already know Dr. Devi Shetty wrote uh, a feature piece which is called as Desi Dil Global Life Saver because if something were to happen in this direction, 29,000 patients, I mean, now if, with, a, with a fraction of cost, say 10 lakhs. You could really, it could really become affordable and it can really be a breakthrough we are all looking at. So if, if you want to know a bit about, although we don't have time to tell you a lot about JSNST because things are now moving very fast in the forward direction. In the first phase, we, what we are trying to do is reimagine medical education and innovation by having a program that is going to be engineering or technology driven medical school or medical education along with a super speciality hospital and some of you would already know that we opened tender for a new building of medical school and hospital out of the two contenders we would uh, very uh, soon hone on one and then uh, award the tender so that the buildings would start really would start the HMV road uh, at the moment we have 11 centers of excellence in telemedicine infectious diseases non-invasive diagnostics, therapeutics, etc. So 11 centers all have been funded internally at the moment. All of these funded uh, centers have been given internal funds to nuclear research programs so that we can uh, sort of lead from at least in R&D by the time building is coming up because once the building comes up, we are going to first look at postgraduate academic programs, DM, MD, MD, PhD, depending on what kind of regulations are needed from Medical Council of India and how quickly we can bring it all in one place, including bachelor level immersion programs. So we are working on bachelor level immersion programs where at least two of such immersion programs can be brought in with our students, with the students which could be then elevated, mature to the level of postgraduate programs. And for this, we are talking with a lot of uh, universities abroad, so that the right kind of blend of education, not the AIMS type, and I'm being categorical here. So we are not looking at AIMS or classical medical education, because those guys do not study much of what our BTEC students will study, technical drawing, etc. So we would like to blend in engineering driven medical education and I would see your, your help, your inputs while we devise these academic programs and of course there would be a lot of possibilities for uh, uh, for, for other postdoctoral fellows etc. So in addition to Vidyantra, in addition to Vidyantra we have just awarded in last two to three days the financial sanction from institute has come for four flagship projects and I would like to go through that one is self-navigating smart wheelchair by Vishal Bhattacharya and team. One is percutaneous mechanical circulatory support. This is again blood circulation device that is being proposed by Pranath Joshi and his team. Uh, single optical fiber based endoscope being worked out by Harsha Banadeh, Shilpi Gupta and their team. Because this is again, as I am given to understand, 
at a very advanced level of maturity they are they have put together the right optics the right kind of you know uh, hardware and they are eventually going to realize this endoscope and 3d printed interbody spacer for spinal deformities which includes nanoparticles for antibacterial activity which is being taken up by ashok kumar uh, shikhar jha and their team uh, we also got two proposals shortlisted where they were not really there as flagship but with some support they could become uh, a flagship project so we are we are putting them under technology demonstrator which is one of which is rapidly deployable cardiac digital twin by ketan rajavardhan ji so they are going to work on uh, digital twin of heart and we also have we hope that at some point of time some of us could come together to also realize digital twin of brain because neuroscience is the next frontier of research and if we can bring it together if we can bring the right kind of digital twin for neuroscience it would be really great our uh, technology platform for eradication of bacteria by plasmodium vivim by nagma parveen and her team and finally what i show you is future in making some of you may have seen these pictures and this is what about architectural rendering looks like the medical school the this block has already been started this if you go back you can see this this g plus 45 uh, floors have come up for the residents accommodation that has already been uh, built up and rest of the things will come up in next two years the idea is to finish the building by june 2025 and we are almost running at this time to take the first student in july 2025 so our director has already given up you know sort of uh, that statement at several forums and we are backing their statement hoping to realize the grand vision of having the medical school on campus and with this i thank all of you this is the reflection of what would be the singhania super specialty hospital i thank all of you uh, i may have you know sort of brought some of the ideas of ascent disruption one by ai and machine learning where we can use biomedical data to leapfrog in drug discovery efforts and the second one be where we can take take a device for example the hridayanta the elvar it elvar and bring it to maturity so that it can be commercialized it can be brought to the market at a fraction of cost which is being sold across the world so these disruptors are the two which are really close to you know uh, being achieved here in our campus with with help of with the help of all of you and this is where i stop by felicitating all of you for the national technology day thank you very much for the opportunity